One of the ways RPGs set themselves apart from other games is their scale, scope, and comparatively long run times. While a game like Super Mario 64 can be beaten in just a few hours, a game like Final Fantasy X might take you a few days to fully complete. Because of this, a common trap RPGs fall into is being too long or having content just for the sake of having content. But in the case of Bug Fables The Everlasting Sapling, we are treated to seven chapters of well-paced storytelling that doesn't seem to ever hit a point that feels unnecessary or slow. However, despite not having a single bad section, that does not mean that some chapters weren't better than others, so today we will be ranking in order all seven of Bug Fables chapters. Chapter 4, Mysterious Lost Sands Chapter 4 has many memorable moments that are worthy of praise. The capture of Team Snakemouth, the surprise assault of the Dune Scorpion, and the reveal of the Watcher are just a few standout moments that help define this chapter. Couple those moments with a feeling of anticipation and wonder about what will happen when you finally close in on the final artifact, and you have the recipe for a great chapter. So why is chapter 4 my least favorite, you may be asking. I think it's because I feel like I've played this chapter before. While Bug Fables never tries to hide its inspiration, I feel the similarities are too strikingly close to chapter 2 of Paper Mario. Both take place in a large grid-like desert and require the assistance of a cloaked figure to help you progress. Both feature huge castles that emerge from beneath the sand to serve as the chapter dungeon and both feature bosses that employ magic and attempt to ward you off before the fight. And while I enjoy the bandit's hideout section, I feel let down that this is the only new area of the chapter. Every other chapter in the game gets a whole new area to traverse and explore, whereas you just get more bandit fights in the Lost Sands in this one. Despite these flaws, moments like Zasp rescuing the team or Astasili's request to put him down help to give the chapter some unique personality that makes Bug Fables what it is. Chapter 7, The Everlasting Sapling The final chapter of Bug Fables is defined by the twists that it throws at you along the way. Whether it's learning of the Roach's village and purpose, Queen Elizant's decision to destroy the game's namesake, or the discovery of a wilted everlasting sapling, these moments create tension and help keep you invested to the very end. Even the final showdown with the Everlasting King has a final twist, as the failed ruler is transformed into something very ordinary and forgettable, the one thing he desired most not to be. Chapter 7 is extremely centered around this final conclusion with the Wasp King, and as a result, not much else is offered. The giant's land, albeit terrifying and stressful, is largely barren with only a few screens and a battle with the Deadlanders toward the end. Similarly, the fridge lasts only a few floors and reuses enemies we previously saw in Chapter 4. Even the Roach's village has little new to offer and simply feels like a buffer before you face the final boss. However, despite Chapter 7's disappointing start, the ending truly salvages what would otherwise be a very short, empty chapter. Not only is the fight with the Everlasting King challenging and epic, but the conclusion is satisfying and rewarding. Seeing all the various characters you've encountered along your journey come to Ant Kingdom City to celebrate Team Snakemouth's triumph is a perfect way to cap off the game. You can appreciate the strength of Team Snakemouth's bond and admire their progression as they are knighted as royal blades by the Queen. And in true Bug Fables fashion, you're left with some humor and a homage to Paper Mario in the credits as the game comes to a fitting conclusion, making it feel like Bulgaria truly has peace again. Chapter 1, A Dysfunctional Trio One of the ways Bug Fables impresses the most is in how quickly it is able to create an atmosphere that feels both lighthearted and adventurous. Right from the beginning of its storybook intro, you can tell that this will be a journey about exploration, teamwork, and friendship. It's about overcoming danger and making discoveries, not strength and treasure, despite what V might tell you at first. And from the start when Kabu and V pass Maki's explorer tests, you can see firsthand the strength that lurks out in Bulgaria, waiting to end your journey at a moment's notice. It's this atmosphere, along with a remarkable theme called Outskirts, that helps you feel like a true explorer when you finally set out on your own. This is why Chapter 1 shines, because by establishing its identity early, 
Bug Fables immediately starts getting emotional payoffs. Moments such as when V returns to save Kabu or when the team finally defeats the spider hold more emotional weight because it is established from the first few scenes how integral overcoming adversity is to our main characters, whether to prove themselves or just to survive. And through their perseverance, the team is able to grow and connect, forming a strong foundation for both an explorer team and a friendship. Snake Mouth Den itself is also a great first dungeon for the game. It has a mysterious, inquisitive theme that creates an eerie vibe and aesthetic. It provides a nice balance between fighting and puzzle solving. It has a tremendous boss fight with a catchy theme, and it ends on an enticing cliffhanger that makes you want to play more. There are very few flaws I see with Chapter 1, and it's why starting a new file is exciting whether it's your first time or your tenth. Chapter 3, Factory Inspection Tackling emotionally difficult situations is a strength of Bug Fable's fantastic writing. Every main character has a realistic and relatable personal journey that sees them reflect on their past, look within, and grow as individuals. Chapter 3 is the first instance we can really see this in full effect as V returns home to the Hive for the first time since leaving on bad terms to become an explorer. Along your journey, V has been shaping your expectations of other bees into a negative one, proclaiming them to be stuck up and even stating she's worth four normal bees. Despite this, Kabu and Leaf eventually learn that V has been making up a majority of the negative things she's been saying about the bees, and the animosity is one-sided on her part. Now, while this chapter may be focused on collecting the next sapling artifact, it really is about V making things right in her life before she fully moves on as an explorer. As the chapter progresses, you see her gradually take accountability for her actions, using her mission as an explorer as a means of making amends with Queen Bianca, the Overseer, and others. By ensuring a safe swap of the Honey Factory Power core, V is then able to clear away the baggage of her past and make room for the maturity she'd need to have in order to reconcile with her sister later. It's a heartwarming arc that addresses the difficulty in admitting you're wrong, apologizing, and learning from your own mistakes. But I'd be remiss if I only talked about V's story because Chapter 3 has so much more going for it. The Honey Factory shutdown was a creative way to create suspense and conflict for an otherwise pedestrian chapter to that point. Defeating the Honey Nation and saving Mathiva and Zasp was a memorable and hilarious moment. Several new areas including the Lost Sands, Defiant Root, and the Hive open up for exploration. And by forbidding you to approach the Lost Kingdom border, the seeds for the eventual conflict with the Wasps are sown deeper. My complaints of Chapter 3 are few and far between, mainly being disappointed in the lack of fast travel in and out of the Hive and the heavy drone boss fight. While certainly providing more challenge than previous bosses in the game, the fact that the heavy drone is essentially a giant bee boop with no build up is a little bit of a letdown for me. Thankfully, the funny dialogue and boss themes surrounding the fight make up for these flaws, and we are left with one of the better chapters in the game. Chapter 2, Sacred Golden Hills The Sacred Golden Hills chapter stands out to me as the point where Bug Fables truly begins to pick up and flesh out its identity. Not only do we get to see more defined personalities from V, Leaf, and Kabu, but we are introduced to many new characters such as Queen Elizant, Mothiva, and Venus. We are given access to Ant Kingdom City with its libraries, houses, and shops. Gameplay elements such as cooking, banking, and fast travel are all introduced, and fun side quests become available for the first time. The plot too starts to develop as we discover more about the history and lore of Bulgaria, such as learning that the ants and bees are allies, or that Leaf was alive during the reign of Queen Elizabeth I. The team has their first encounters with the wasps, who you learn are also searching for the artifacts, and we get more hints to V's backstory and troubled relationship with the hive. In addition to new information, Chapter 2 does a great job of piquing your curiosity by hinting at things that come into play later such as Maki's top secret mission, the Queen's plan for the sapling, and the fact that Venus cannot sense Leaf despite seeing him with her own eyes. These unanswered questions help to give the world a feeling of wonder and mystery with secrets out there just waiting to be uncovered. And in general, the aesthetic and gameplay become more unique in Chapter 2. The reds, browns, and oranges of the Golden Path create a scenic fall setting that feels more interesting to traverse across than the flat snake mouth way. 
The enemies provide more challenge with greater variety, and we're treated to two different mini-boss fights. The Golden Festival itself is charming and fun, allowing you to play mini-games and see bugs of all different species in one place. And although the Golden Hills were a little easy and straightforward in design, it has one of the best mini-bosses in the game and a satisfying ending that has you not only defeating the Venus Guardian and getting the next artifact, but giving Leaf peace of mind in the knowledge that his former team had survived. Chapter 5, The Far Wildlands The Beast is one of my favorite bosses in the game for so many reasons. He is an amazing theme, a terrifying design, and is one of the few bosses in the game with a truly good buildup. But what makes The Beast in Chapter 5 so memorable to me is the moment of Kabu's last stand. From the moment you meet Kabu, you understand that he's been through quite a lot to get to where he is now. You often see him talking to himself, almost reassuringly, as he tries to move on from the tragic events of his journey. And right when the Queen orders you to travel back to the far grasslands, you can see the memories it brings up and the effect it has on him. After realizing that he will be going back to the land that had slain his previous teammates, Kabu plots to use the strength of his new team and the assistance of Maki to track the beast down for revenge. Kabu, acting out of character, omits this information from his team as he guides them naively through the far grasslands and then the wild swamplands. Eventually, the monster is found, and upon finding the beast, Leaf and V, realizing they are outmatched, plead to run. However, Kabu digs in and begins to taunt the creature, having wanted this outcome the whole time. After some back and forth fighting, the beast eventually gets the upper hand by knocking out Kabu's teammates, with the Green Ranger lookalike only hanging on by a thread. Recognizing the arrogance of his ways, Kabu powers up and finds the resolve to finally defeat the beast in order to protect his new friends. This conclusion was as unexpected as it was satisfying. It was nice to see real raw anger and emotion from a character that had largely been portrayed as the level-headed straight man. It felt wholesome to see V say that she would do the same for Kabu, and it was reassuring to hear Leaf tell Kabu that his team would be proud of him for what he's become. In the end, Kabu got the closure and revenge he wanted, plus it culminated in finally gaining access to the previously forbidden Wasp Kingdom. Another moment from this chapter that helps define bug fables is the Wasp's invasion of Ant Kingdom City. The urgency that is created when you hear an exhausted and injured Zass warning is only bested by the scene of chaos you arrive at when you make it back to town. The normally bright sunny plaza has been turned into a smoldering orange mess and the ant guards have been battered and beaten. The team runs to the palace to save the queen but find themselves horribly outmatched by the Wasp King's fire. Though Maki swoops in to save the day, no section of the game to that point makes you feel desperation quite like this. And when you enter the Wasp Kingdom to discover you've been tricked by General Ultimax, only to rush back to be bested by the Wasp King again, the desperation feels worse. But it's these moments of helplessness that ultimately define what Chapter 5 is all about. These moments test not only Team Snake Mouth's strengths, but the Queen's and all of Ant Kingdom cities as well. And because of this, you see the unity of Bagaria beginning to form as these dark times approach, making for excellent gameplay and even better storytelling. Because oftentimes the most impressive thing is not how hard you hit, but how you respond when you get hit hard. Chapter 6, Assault on Rubber Prison Understanding and keeping your ego in check is something that Team Snake Mouth has been confronted with repeatedly over the course of Bug Fables. For V, she has to put aside her issues with the bees and apologize in order to return to the hive and reconcile with her sister. In Kabu's case, he's forced to put his desire for vengeance towards the beast against the safety of his new teammates. And for Leaf, the revelation of his past challenges him to confront his self-worth and identity. And in all of these cases, it takes true strength of character to be able to put your ego aside when things get rough. To swallow your pride in order to move ahead takes maturity and conviction in your beliefs. And it's why the Queen's arc in Chapter 6 is so impactful. After the Wasp King attacks for the second time and dispatches of both Team Snake Mouth and Kina, Queen Elizant is forced to make a difficult decision. Despite searching for the sapling artifacts her whole life, the pain of seeing her citizens being attacked drives the Queen to relinquish the magical items to her enemy. Defeated, frustrated, and embarrassed, Elizant takes off her royal mask and proclaims herself not worthy of being Queen. 
In a tender moment, Team Snakemouth and the rest gathered in the throne room support and encourage Elizant as she reveals her true intentions with the Everlasting Sapling to bring back the true queen, Elizant I. This admission not only shocks you as you've thought Queen Elizant I to be long gone, but your perception of Elizant II is dramatically altered. You realize she is a selfless queen who is willing to do whatever it takes to bring peace and prosperity to her land, and this is backed up as she makes the journey personally to the Termite Kingdom in order to gain aid against the Wasps. Her willingness to not only put her reputation in danger, but her own life helps to complete a character arc as strong as any character in the game. Now aside from Queen Elizant's character development, which I do believe is the defining aspect of Chapter 6, I think the Termite Capital also stands out as the best town in the game. From the dingy underground vibe of its streets to the cool, relaxed sounds of its themes, there's much to be explored and enjoyed in the land of the Termites. The palace, tall buildings, and unique shops like Dynamite, as well as the Colosseum all help to give this area a lot of personality. And the forsaken lands that must be journeyed across to reach the termite capital only help to add to this somber atmosphere. And with the acquisition of the new boat, you also unlock new areas this chapter that you may not have visited before such as Metal Island, the Fishing Village, or Peacock Island. But if these new areas and the forsaken lands, termite capital, and coliseum weren't enough for you, the assault on rubber prison is intense, trying, and full of powerful enemies. You once again battle with General Ultimax, except this time he has a badass theme and a tank, and you acquire an item that will finally level the playing field during your next encounter with the Wasp King. The chapter ends on an empowering note too, with Queen Elizant and every exploration team ready by your side to invade the giant slayer and help take back the sapling artifacts. With the stage set for the final showdown and everyone by your side, what more could you ask for? Thanks everybody for watching my ranking of all of Bug Fable's chapters. Did you agree with my list? Feel like a chapter should have been lower or higher? Let me know in the comments and if you liked this video be sure to give it a like and subscribe and stay tuned for my next video.